Thank you for coming out today to the Catherine Schweinsberg Rood Central Library here in the beautiful city of Coco. I'm Jamal. I work here at the reference desk. Many of you know me. Um, I won't be before you long because I got to get back to the desk. We're <laughs> short staff today. We can we usually are. Um, but I'd like to take the time out to first thank Mr. Gene Lahovic. I think I pronounced his name right. Yeah. In conjunction with the Brevard Authors Association of, of Local Writers for coordinating this event and for the monthly uh, author discussions that we have here because of this gentleman, we thank you. Um, uh, he's also gotten us into the Vieira Voice newspaper, the, uh, what, what's the other one? Senior. Uh, the Senior, senior, senior Life newspaper. Life. We read there, I think, in August of this year because of our author talks. So uh, we do thank him for that. And for promoting all the literary talent that's right here in Brevard County, Gene, we thank you for your hard work and your dedication. Um, we have a very special treat for you today. Uh, this event is about six months in the making. And my director, Julie, who's not here today, uh, and myself, we had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Bourne about six months ago, uh, getting to know him and hearing some of his story. And it's a fascinating story, which I'm sure he'll share with you today, um, of how he went from being a law enforcement agent to authoring award-winning and best-selling novels in the thriller and mystery genres, uh, to co-authoring over 20 books with the great James Patterson. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> Before we bring Mr. Bourne forward, we're going to bring uh, the gentleman I was just speaking of a moment ago, uh, Mr. Gene Lahovic, uh, who made all of this possible. Let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Gene Lahovic. Thank you uh, very much. I don't really have much to add to it. It's already taken everything that I was going to say. <laughs> See you tomorrow. We do have a special treat. We have an author who has reached the sky, I can say, in my opinion. In my humble opinion, I think he's just one to be more appreciated at his own best. And here he is, Mr. James O'Horn. I always have notes, but don't panic because I don't really talk. <laughs> but I'm always worried, especially as I get older. What's going to happen if I forget what I was going to say? And then I look down, but here's where I trick myself. I miss you. I have <laughs> kind of a general idea. And this is a really uh, good topic. Uh, I want to thank Gene, first of all. Uh, and he publishes books under Gene Luke, L U K E. Uh, and this, this is all because of him, because I was very content being isolated in my little house <laughs> up north of Coco, where no one really knew where I lived. <laughs> uh, but he, he saw my name on the list from my, when we, we haven't lived here long. I joined the computer club and uh, the Brevard County Users Group, the guys like, uh, it meets over at the other library on Merritt Island. And, uh, he asked Dan, uh, the head of the club, hey, I know a writer named Jim Bourne, or James O'Bourne. And, and Dan met us together, and Gene talked me into doing this, set this up, and it's been relentless. <laughs> <laughs> That's Gene. <deep. laughs> it was a little relentless with me. Too. <laughs> I could have used him in my law enforcement career. Yeah. <laughs> and I always start off, this not true. I always think I'm going to start off by saying the next thing I'm going to say, but probably 80% of the time I forget it. Uh, but uh, uh, you can friend me on Facebook. I don't care if it's on my author page or on my personal page. It doesn't matter. Not, it's just James O'Born, not hiding from anyone. But uh, I support two things strongly, or I try to. The YMCA mainly, because they do 
if there, if there are more YMCA's, there really would be fewer need for police officers, trust me. Mm. Uh, so I support the Y, and we have some books we're gonna, we're gonna auction some off. Uh, Gene's in charge of what's going on, but we're gonna auction some off. And there's some for sale, but any that are for sale, the money's gonna be split between the Y, some to the library, stuff like that. Uh, so, for once, I actually got out the most important part of my talk. Uh, I, uh, years ago, so my, my first book came out in 2004, and I did a little public speaking. I was the head of the office for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement in Broward County at the time. So I used to do public speaking for them, and it wasn't really nerve-wracking. I wouldn't, uh, I don't mind speaking in public, uh, but uh, I went to the Historical Society of Palm Beach County. It was a big deal in Palm Beach County there. I was a member. I thought, I wasn't at the time, but I didn't know my members. And I thought, this is great. It's crowd. And I asked the lady who was sponsoring it, I said, I've got a couple of talks. Do you want it G-rated, PG, do you want it R-rated? And she said, our last speaker filled us in on the history of air conditioning in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> I want an R-rated talk. <laughs> and she was very serious about it. <laughs> and I had a couple of jokes that, I mean, they were, I would never do them today. Oh. I was thinking about doing them at the time, and as I looked down, an elderly woman waved to me. And I looked down, she was really animated, and I realized, it was Mrs. McCall, my fourth grade teacher. Oh. <laughs> and all of my far away jokes went right out of the <laughs> uh, But uh, I, Gene and I talked about what he wanted me to talk about, and it seems to me, and I could be wrong, that there's a lot of people from the Brevard Authors Coalition and Florida Writers Association and things like that here. So I will gear it a little bit towards uh, writing. Not that I wasn't going to talk about writing, but uh, you know how I got my breaks, things like that. Uh, I always wanted to be a writer. I was a big reader. Jim and I were just talking. I was, my dad read almost a book a day, and he kept them. Uh, he had we had a hallway in my old Florida house in West Palm Beach that probably had at one point five thousand paperbacks that he had read and saved. Uh, we're we're close to that. Uh, we gave away about probably a thousand books when we moved up here. Uh, but in just a month or so, we have someone installing shelves in the library for us. So I can finally bring my books up that are in storage right now. Uh, but I always wanted to be a writer. Uh, I tried a little bit when I was in Florida State. Uh, I wrote an article for the uh, Florida Flambeau, which was a student newspaper on road construction. And I realized in that short article, I don't care anything about journalism. This is a pain for a little bit of information. I could just say, look at the windows. The roads are all screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> so I would read, I read a lot. I, I don't read as much as my wife reads more than I do. My daughter does too. They go through, I don't know, two or three books a week. Uh, I have slowed down a little bit because I have kind of a busy schedule. <clears throat> I have a boat and we live on the river. I'm always <laughs> uh, But uh, I, so I got into law enforcement when I realized, uh, you know, I studied psychology at Florida State and I went to Southern Miss working on my master's degree and it wasn't anything I wanted to do. It kind of, kind of hit me about halfway through, which probably happens to a lot of people in college. Uh, so I started thinking about what I really wanted to do, what my strengths were and things like that. And I got interested in law enforcement. And so, fast forward a few years, and I, I'm working for the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, which is a good job. It's a great job. I love it. Uh, it was interesting, probably not near as interesting as you imagine it would be, but it was, it was interesting. And, but we do a lot of surveillance, and I have to, you have to kill time. People don't understand. It's not like in the movies where surveillance <coughs> lasts 10 minutes. It might last three days to catch three minutes of criminal activity. And you're not watching that person the whole time. There's, there might be 10 of you on a surveillance just before we were, we had all the, the higher tech stuff. So we would read books and trade them around. 
And I realized pretty quickly I couldn't read police books anymore because they were just, I'm sorry, they were so stupid, most of them. Uh, and not that mine now are any different, <laughs> but uh, you know, they, everyone was bigger than life. And I look around me at these guys beaten down by a job that really held no uh, resemblance to what you read in the books. So I read a lot of military books. I read W.B. Griffin. Any W.B. Griffin fans in here? He, he's the best. Um, Tom Clancy. Uh, most people know Tom Clancy. Although, in my opinion, uh, Griffin's a better military writer. More interesting, historically very accurate. He's been in the military. Uh, he passed away uh, a few years ago, and his son, Phil Butterworth, the fourth. Uh, is continuing the book. Uh, so I wanted to write, and one of my dad's friends uh, was going to a talk at a library by a writer named Elmo Leonard. And he wasn't super well known at the time, but he was popular. He had a couple of movies out, and something like he was towards the end of his life. And when I was there, I met him, and my dad's friend said, hey, the gym's with the DEA, and Dutch, Elmo Leonard, said, so you guys handle a lot of guns. Well, yeah, he, he had had a problem in a book where he had, he, he, I had read Unknown Man number 89 before I met him. And uh, it was my first Elmo Leonard book. And he, he was very good, like all of his books. I've read all of them now. And he said, uh, did you see the problem with the book instead? I said, no, it was great. I had seen the problem, but I didn't. <laughs> and he said, come on. You're around guns. You didn't see a price. Then, okay. The hero fumbles with the safety on a Smith and Western revolver. And Smith and Western revolvers don't have a safety. <laughs> Can I call you sometime? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah. And I give him, this is well before cell phones. That telegraphs were still being. <laughs> and the very next Monday, that was on a Thursday, the next Monday, you get a call at the office. And it's Elmore Leonard. And he said, hey, how do I get a gun through airport security for a book? Obviously, he wasn't looking to hijack <laughs> And he, uh, I said, you know, what are you trying to do? And he said, well, they have a fight and a cop has to pull a gun too. I said, well, the easy way to get around that is 25% of all cops are killed in the line of duty are killed with their own weapon. And he went, how? Oh, I didn't know that. And so that was the, the book, Get Shorty. Oh, uh, so I, got to, I was involved with every book after Get Shorty on. Wow. Even a couple of history books, like Jubilee, right? Uh, you asked me if you guys were in A lot of them would make it to the So I would, one day, Dutch said to me, you should put, you've got some story sense. You should put some of your stuff into fiction form. And that's all I needed. I mean, <laughs> I didn't need a lot more. And I started working on a book without really studying writing, which I have now. Uh, and I still continue to. My daughter gave me a book on Russian sto short stories for Christmas. And now that I'm actually reading it, I'm wondering if she pranked me because short story, Russian short stories are miserable. <laughs> depression. Even their happy ones are sad. <laughs> But uh, I, I worked on a book and it, it didn't go anywhere. Uh, I, I tried. I, uh, you know, people think, oh, you know, a big writer, you'll just walk in. But no, all anyone wants is can this book sell and can in publishing? Because you got to, writing is an art, publishing is a business. Can this sell and can I make money out of it? That's what every agent thinks. So they don't care anything about your background. They just want to know, okay, is this person presentable? Can we make money on it? So my books were, they didn't feel like they were going to make any money on this first book. So I worked, uh, I did a, just a short undercover thing helping another agency. And, and I went to a Ku Klux Klan rally, an actual, honest to God rally where they intended to burn the cross. It was a, very disturbing day. It was on July 4th of 1989. Mm. And uh, it was disturbingly close to where I lived at the time. It was a farm area, but my house was only about four or five miles away. Mm -hmm. So we go. <laughs> 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 I 
happens, but I got a lot of interesting tidbits from things. I get every day I hear people say stuff that I think, that's going in a book. And uh, uh, an agent said, I heard he, he knew Elmer Leonard. He said, he did a thing on the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah, it really was not. Uh, but he's like, that's what you should write. And like a dumbass. It's like, okay. <laughs> so I on a book on that. And that book actually got me an agent. Uh, not that agent, but an agent, who showed it around and just felt it was just a, a hair's breadth away from being public. And I thought, well, that's great. Okay. I, I wasn't terribly disturbed. But keep in mind, this takes years, every time. And I know everyone wants their, whatever they're doing to be work out immediately, but I started writing in 1989, the week before my son was born. And uh, to give you an idea, he was done with middle school by the time my first book was published. <laughs> no, or no, he was in middle school. Uh, so I, I had this idea. Uh, I was assigned to one of the, I was on our special operations team, and we had to go to Miami for one of the big, big riots that they used to have kind of regularly down there. And it gave me a great view of overall what chaos might look like. But one of the guys in, on the team, we were sitting there in the briefing, and he saw all the cops that were there, all the different SWAT teams, everything, and he said, we're all here. Who's watching the rest of the county? <laughs> and that is the basis for Walking Money, my first book, my first public book. Uh, and for the writers in here, they all want to hear this story. Uh, I didn't submit it. Uh, I, I had given it to a friend of mine to read, who was kind of an editor in, in New York, and it was sitting on his desk, and he was having a meeting with an agent, and he had to take a phone call. And while he did, he agent just was looking at his desk and started to read my manuscript. Mm -hmm. By the time the guy came back, the agent said, hey, yeah, who is this? And long story short, he called me the next day. And uh, every, everyone, Every time I had an agent kind of interested in the book, I said, "You think it could sell?" And they'd always say, "We'll oh, see what happens." No one wants to commit that. And I'm guilty of the same thing. My kids ask me, "Say, yeah, let's see what happens." <laughs> Generally, that means you know, uh, But he called me, and he's English, and he said, uh, "Hey, I'd like to represent you on this book." I said, "You think you could sell it?" He was the first guy that he kind of chuckled and said, oh, "We'll sell it." Mm. And I said, okay, I didn't sign anything. You, you shouldn't, to my knowledge, unless things have changed, you don't sign a contract with an agent. The agent makes money from the sale of your book, period. That's the beginning and end of it. So uh, the next day, he calls me and said, oh, we have two offers. Oh. One of them is from Putnam. Mm -hmm. I would recommend you go, and the, the editor is a guy named Neil Lamont, who's still a good friend of mine. Uh, and the other people he happened to edit were Tom Clancy and W.E. Griffin. Oh. And I thought, okay, yeah, that sounds like a good plan. Oh. Uh, what's funny is I haven't given a lot of talks, you know, the, between the COVID and travel a lot. Uh, and now with Patterson, he does all the promotion. I don't really, that's what I like about it, is I don't have to do, uh, you know, scramble around. In fact, that's how I talked to him into it. He said, I never, never have to go on book tour again. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I, I get this offer and I take it. The book got good reviews, really good reviews at the time. But I spoke this year at a library and for a library, it wasn't in the library, in Fort Myers, a fundraiser. You know, they had they'd been hit by the hurricane and stuff. And I did nothing but apologize for my first book, because if you read it today, boy, it's horrendous as far as the language. And you learn that stuff as you go along. I was trying to capture what people really say. Uh, and and then one of the characters is known in the book for stringing together four-letter words. And in a colorful way, and people like that, it's funny. But now I look at it, um, I, I wouldn't want my, my family to read this book. The other thing is back then you could make political <coughs> jokes. And I would make jokes in each book different, you know, one time it might be a different craft one. 
I would never do that. <laughs> and in Milwaukee Money, I think I, I made a joke about Janet Reno, who I actually liked. I don't never met her. But there was something I didn't really like about her, and I knew guys that had dealt with her. Uh, and I made some joke on Janet Reno. It wasn't a horrendous joke. Uh, and then in a later book, in fact, I think it's this one, uh, might be Feel the Fire or the sequel to it. Uh, I made jokes about the Republicans, about a guy who was faking a Texas accent in the administration. Nothing to it. Would I do that today? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. And you kind of evolve as you're working on it. So I, I will admit my career got off to a, a good start with a good publisher, but I realized, you know, publishing is a roller coaster. At the time my kids were young. I'm not about to quit my job. So for quite a while, I was working for FDLE. I was publishing books and I was raising my kids. My wife was there sometimes. But, <laughs> <laughs> and she's a little bit of a drinker. There wasn't that much. <laughs> uh, I'm not upset about her hearing that. She's a little drunk now, so she's like, I, I, I went through all this and I was writing and I was staying pretty much on schedule. And then by the time I was secure enough in my career, you guys slipped in like ninjas. Mm -hmm. uh, there are friends from Palm Beach County who were there at the beginning when it started. Yeah. Uh, and I would, uh, you know, I'd have to work late at night or early in the morning. I tried very diligently not to do it during the day. However, I would take calls from publishers because. I wasn't going to say, hey, uh, you know, I'm busy right now. Call me back after yeah. six. No. Um, and it, it, it all kind of worked out. By the time I, I felt like I was secure in my career, I was close enough to retirement. I was like, I can finish this out. And it really, what I found was the kids were the real drag on my, my time. Once they were in college and out of the house, I did something. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, uh, I continued with uh, working with Putnam on my crime novels, but I always wanted to, I love science fiction. I read science fiction. Where Bob and I were talking about, uh, we both read a lot, and we both read a lot of science fiction. So we went out to a trip, and we were in Seattle, both family, and I, uh, my son and I dragged my wife and daughter, who were good sports about it. And I know this sounds exciting, to the science fiction Museum and Hall of Fame. No. Uh, which was uh, sponsored by Paul Allen from Microsoft. And as we left, I realized I had read every single book they had out, seen every movie, and really appreciated them. As we're flying home, I, was, I had just finished a book. I started sketching out an idea for a, a science fiction novel. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget it. it. It was fun to write. It moved pretty quick. When I gave it to my agent, she said, you know anyone on your name What's this? I said, science fiction. She said, I've never even read a science fiction. <laughs> and I said, no, that's convenient, because I don't need you to read it. I just need you to sell it. I can't read it and go to And she said, uh, uh, I'm not even sure where to go. I said, send it to Tor. There's a big science fiction publisher. And if they don't like it, you're a big time agent. We cut it the way they tell us, we sell it somewhere else. And I'll tell you what, for any writers in here, agents love that kind of practical, okay, this is a business decision. Uh, and she submitted, I don't know that she read it. Uh, I did switch agents after two books. So the English guy was out of the picture. He's still a friend of mine, but he's done one just like And uh, uh, more shockingly, almost immediately. But Putnam now was saying, we've got a couple. If you use your name as a crime novelist, you can put it on it can't stop you, but people might be mad if they think they're buying a crime novel and it's a science fiction novel. So I went with uh, James O'Neill, which is my middle name, worked out, mm. uh, for The Human Disguise. And one of the reasons I did it, this is a little uh, uh, mercenary, but it's much easier to get science fiction novels optioned for TV or movies. And this one actually was optioned a couple of times. It wasn't ever made. But 
better. I didn't get any options on anything else I'd ever written, so hmm. I, was, I was happy. Hmm. Uh, and along that, in the same time frame, my daughter was reading Maximum Ride by James Patterson. Anyone ever read that? It's an excellent young adult, almost a kid's book, I'm not sure. But she liked it so much, uh, she made a little movie about it on a computer. And I saw it, I thought it was cute. Anything Emily did, everyone thinks is cute, even now. So uh, the school board liked it so much, they said, hey, we're going to have her present this movie at an assembly where James Patterson's going to be present. Oh. And it was downtown, and I, I'm not just saying this because I work with him now, but Patterson had arranged to give a book to every fifth grader in Palm Beach County. Oh. Uh, and I don't know if he paid for it himself, he probably did. We split it with the publisher. But it was in this big theater. I remember the theater used to be a movie theater when I was a kid in West Palm Beach. And I could I distinctly see, remember seeing a horror movie when I was 10, like a kiddie movie for an old Boris Karloff, 1970s, 60s Boris Karloff, not the good Boris Karloff. <laughs> it scared me so bad I had to leave the theater. When we walked in, that's really what I'm thinking. <laughs> the, the bookseller who was giving the books away Oh, let me introduce you to James Patterson. So he introduces me. I had at that point I had not read James Patterson. And uh, the first thing he said to me is, I saw her name on the uh, what do you call it? And uh, I wondered if she was writing to you, which is a very nice thing to say to a big time writer like that. Uh, at the time I only had three books out. My third book had just come out. And about two or three weeks later, a couple of my friends from New York get a hold of me and say, hey, have you seen, um, I think it was in the New York Times. And I said, no, no. And he said, uh, James Patterson has an interview with you. So, okay. And I'm thinking, why do I care about this? Well, he had arranged my three books when they took a picture of his house in Palm Beach. My three books were right behind his head. Oh. And I knew right then, that's not a coincidence. Well. That's, a, that's a guy who cares about other people. Dude, turns out he doesn't care that much about other people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I was going to say, when Jamal said, the great James Patterson, I was like, dear God, don't let him ever hear that. <laughs> uh, but he, uh, uh, that made me start to consider him, you know, a really good guy. And he would talk to me. I would run into him at different places over time. And then about 10 or 12 years ago, I get a call out of the blue. Hey, it's Jim Patterson. I got an idea. You might be interested. Okay. And that's when he said, uh, "Remember how he said, we we'll have a few laughs. We'll make a few bucks, and you never have to go on book tour again. You don't have to ever talk to an editor." Mm -hmm. I was like, "I don't have problems with editors, but you know, okay, I'll try that." Uh, I didn't realize that it was a sort of an audition. It was, uh, but I. He said, "Write these. Write three chapters about." He gave me this idea over the weekend. Oh. And we'll talk on Monday. Or one of the end of it. So okay. So but he said you can't tell him. So, so I did the work on it. And apparently like on Monday I handed in on Monday morning. Uh, and I get a call back less than two hours later saying I'm we're about to fax you or email you a uh, contract and a full outline. For what we're going to do. And he, well, it wasn't a big deal to him. I mean, he does this kind of thing all the time. To me, he's like mm -hmm. uh, So, we fast forward a couple of months, four or five months, and I say to him, hey, we've been working on this. When can I tell people? And he said, who are you talking about? And I said, you said not to tell anyone. He said, I knew for that weekend. Oh. <laughs> At which point I told my wife. Oh. <laughs> and he said, I should have been working with cops a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, see, I do have notes. I'm kind of wrong. And I'm, I'm open to any questions you guys have. Uh, I'm not going to answer them, but I'm open. No. <laughs> uh, so, I, uh, I, started working with him. I, I had a, another co-writing experience prior to Patterson. Uh, and, and this is what, uh, for writers, 
you've got to take the opportunities that are offered to you for the easy. Just like this. Who knows what's going to happen out of me talking. I may need someone who can fix my computer and you oh. <laughs> but you, you just you never know. Unless someone here is a tree trimmer, because I am in desperate. <laughs> and I don't this may shock you guys. Tree trimmers are not the most reliable people. Because <laughs> I've been through several and no one comes back the second time to do the actual trimming. Oh man. Um, but uh, I always try to keep my options open. So I wrote these science fiction books and I enjoyed writing. Uh, I wrote this is the human disguise, and then the second one is called Double Human. And uh, easily some of the best reviews I had. Uh, and if you get a star review from Publishers Weekly or one of the other big publications, it goes into a, a thing that movie producers see. Mm. No matter what your sales are, they'll see a star review. Mm. So both the science fiction books were star reviews, and one of them published weekly called them Wildly Entertaining, which was actually my goal when I wrote the book. They're not going to change the world. They're not answering any big issues. It's a crime novel set about 20 years in the future. No matter when you read it, it's about 20 years in the future. So uh, I get a call one day. After I finished my two-book contract with them, in fact, to write crime novels, uh, the editor there calls me and says, hey, uh, we have someone on contract that really likes your books, and you've written nonfiction, but you like to write a novel, and you like your books, and he's wondering if we could introduce you. So he wouldn't tell me who it was. And I knew he was friends with a radio guy that had a national audience that was called Up All Night. Does anyone remember that? Uh, he was a little bit, he did a lot of stuff on aliens and things like that. I can't remember the guy's name. Hart Bell. Oh, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. Hart Bell. So I thought, is Art Bell. So that night I listened to a couple of his, and I'm like, I'm pretty open minded about working with people, but it's some crazy stuff. Yeah. And I thought, no, oh, it's novel, it doesn't matter. Turns out it wasn't Art Bell. Oh. It was a an actual financial guy, Lou Dobbs. So I mean, Lou Dobbs. Uh -huh. oh. And I said, you know, and we talked for a few minutes, and I said, Lou, it's no offense. We hadn't agreed to anything. But, you and I are probably not going to agree on everything. Or much. Or mm -hmm. And he said the one answer that no one can dispute. Isn't that why we live in America? Like, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> and it turned out to be a very pleasant experience. He was an easy guy to deal with. The novels weren't, they weren't political novels. One, well, I guess they were in some One is called Border War. And it's about drug dealing in, on the border. And, I mean, I, I'm writing it off like it all. Oh, what? I worked hard on the novel, and I was happy with the end of it. The second one was, I want to call it shooting war, but the publisher changed it to last minute to Putin's gambling, and it's about Putin invading one of his neighbors unsuccessfully. I did not use Ukraine, I used Estonia, and everyone's like, oh, are the political undergrounds? I mean, you can tell people this, and this is the truth. I knew I could spell Estonia. And we did go to Estonia. I had a little idea of it. And it, it, it all worked out. So, and then when I had my own, my next novel come out, uh, Dobbs had me on his show. As a writer, to get on a national show mm -hmm. is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So, uh, all that kind of worked out. Uh, I took the opportunities that, that presented themselves to me, even short stories. I had a couple of short stories that, you know, I didn't really want to write, but I felt obligated to, for whatever reason. Uh, one of those actually was kicked around in Hollywood. Uh, just another kind of a zombie. It wasn't really a zombie, but it, it, it was someone defending a castle. And they, oh, it's medieval. But it turns out it's the ruins of Disney World and then Cinderella's castle. <laughs> uh, so uh, I started working with uh, Patterson. It's a little hazy to me and, and to him, I think. Uh, but about 12 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, and I started with a couple of the bookshops. You guys remember the short books? He thought he could rejuvenate reading by 
books that you could read in about the time it would take you to watch a movie, which is a great idea. They didn't really take off. Uh, but I did a couple of those, and then he said, hey, I have this series. Turns out it was the second biggest series behind the uh, uh, Alex Cross series, uh, the Michael Bennett series. So I had read these, there were six people, seven people, me. Uh, and I got a sense of what he wanted. It's about a detective with 10 adopted kids. Mm. The book. So it's a big, a lot of family stuff. And I, I will say, Patterson has got, I love him. I'll joke about him. I have nothing bad to say about him in any way. He's a good guy. He does look out for people. And he's got a good sense of humor. He's people are scared of him. I'll admit, you know, you talk to people, oh, I could never approach you. But uh, I played a couple of jokes on him, literary jokes. That's me like to me not. We were talking about 10 kids. That's a lot of extra characters you're trying, trying to do. I have a list yeah. of each of the kids with their hobbies and stuff like that that I can't even keep them straight. And I'm my 11th book in just on that series. Wow. And, uh, so I, I had done uh, So I made up a fake chapter, several chapters, for someone sneaks into their apartment. Planes a bomb. Mm. And Patterson stops. He right in front of her at lunch and he goes, Let me guess. The bomb goes off and kills all the kids. <laughs> the jerk. He kills six of the kids. <laughs> he, he laughed and took it seriously for a second. Oh, not a psychopath. Okay. And, uh, the kids are all adopted. So recently, and this is not a spoiler, because I won't tell you exactly. We were talking about, and his wife dies in the first book. So it, now he's getting remarried. And we talked about if the new wife gets pregnant. So I made up another fake outline of a couple of chapters where, or no, I was telling him, uh, just what are your thoughts? And I said, well, she has the baby. Then it finally has a, a uh, biological child. So he sends the other ten kids back to the orphanage. <laughs> <laughs> and this was perfect because he just stared at me like I had made the worst error. <laughs> I mean it went on it was silence and I thought, I'm not gonna break this. This is too good. I sat there, I didn't smile. I looked at him like I am dead serious. And then finally he goes, I accuse people of, not, of taking me too literally all the time. And I just fell for it. And you got me joking. Yeah. So, um, I am, uh, I do live locally now. We, we moved uh, during the pandemic from Palm Beach County, which I love Palm Beach County. I didn't really want to leave. What's funny is, I was born in West Palm Beach. I've lived all over, but I, I was born in West Palm Beach. And Coco is essentially West Palm Beach from the 1960s. Right, right. It was so nice. Uh, traffic. I know local people think traffic's bad. I think you need to go somewhere else for yeah. <laughs> I used to I used to my son moved to Atlanta. So we use that as uh, he'd come back to Boynton and be like, man, the roads are empty. <laughs> but now I, I go down to Boynton or wherever we're going and I'm like, I, I freak out. I can't I I don't remember it being like that. I'm sure it was. Uh, I my, our first, we've been here exactly three years. Last week was our third anniversary. And our first Thanksgiving, I got up early, and I got on my bike, and I got on US-1 and headed north. There was no one was just barely gone. Coming back, I, a, a branch was sticking out and caught my wheel, and flipped me into the road. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I had landed, and I thought, oh, I broken my head. And I'm sitting there, and I think, well, someone's going to be buying a minute. I don't have a phone. Now I can carry a phone on my bike. Mm. Uh, and I was there three or four minutes, and it was not a car in any direction. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized I'm a little bit of a wimp because I got up and my hip was fine. <laughs> <laughs> and I came home and I had a few road rashes. And we had four kids there, and not one of them acknowledged that I had blood on my bed. Like, hey, where are you? What were you? Why didn't you make us breakfast? <laughs> I, uh, I do like it here, uh, and I, I'm involved, I try to get involved with a, a couple of groups. So uh, if you uh, 
I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm going to hang around for a little bit if anyone wants to come up with that. Yes, sir. Not a question for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got two questions on your first two novels. Okay. The first one you claim was four and wasn't well written, and you're just starting now. No, no, no. I said it was hard to read okay. because it's so politically incorrect. The first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that was hard to sell. No, no, no. Back then, then you said it was something wrong with it. Now it's hard to read because it's out of date. Oh, okay. It uses racial slurs. Now, to be fair, only the bad guys use it. And an editor, uh, a lot of you know, Pauline <coughs> Cogdell from the uh, Tribune Network, or Sentinel Network, yeah. She, and uh, I remember her review, he said he takes a very serious and open look at racism, which is what I was trying to do. But on the flip side, I meet people who say, oh, I read that book, that's a racist book. No, it's not. <coughs> but now when I read it, I, am, I feel like I have to apologize to people. So, so, my question was really what transpired in your writing life from the first novel to the second, which sold itself on somebody's desk. Uh, something had to happen. No, no, the book. first book sold itself on somebody's desk. What was the first book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, that's uh, so, so, yeah. Uh, so there, are, there are three books, and it has to do with uh, an affiliation, which I was affiliation. And so was your sheriff here in Palmage County. At the same time I was in Brevard County, the same time I was. Uh, and uh, the second one, my editor talked to me and said, okay, now you wrote the edgy book, or you wrote the God Attention, now we're going to back off a little bit. So it doesn't have a lot of the stuff that really tried to make it interesting. It's a little funnier. No one actually dies in that book. You don't realize it. Everyone says, oh, body count climbs. But in fact, no one dies in the whole book. Wow. Uh, and it's about a bomber, uh, a guy who's good with just mixing things, mixing chemicals and stuff. And it, they're trying to, now the only thing that's, uh, uh, terrorism was, was still on everyone's mind back then. I had to make it uh, so you realize there were other things going on, why they were so concerned about some of the things that happened in the book. Uh, and I'll never forget one of my friends, a guy named Jason Starr, some of you know He's written a lot of wild books. I mean, it makes my books look very like dictionaries. <laughs> They're wild, wild stuff. But he said, uh, I read your second book. I said, oh. I was, I, he was with me in person, and he said, <laughs> you sold out. You changed it down just so you could make money. And I was like, or just so you could sell more books. And I was thinking, I could be wrong, but isn't that our job? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I don't want to say that I, I sell out on stuff, but I'm not, it is a business, and if I wanted to stay employed, I tried to follow it. Also, I would meet people, uh, I'm going to drop a name, uh, I know Lee Chapel reasonably well, and early on, he told me, I try not to use foul language in books. Since he told me that, I was like, if he's doing it, if he's not doing it, I'm not going to do it. And it's kind of worked out. Uh, Patterson's books are a little tamer, they don't have, for the most part, foul language. I think in a, the last book that I wrote, which I'm, I'm pretty far ahead, I don't think it comes out until like 2026, I dropped my first F bomb in the past. Mm. But it was appropriate. I mm. thought it was appropriate. Mm. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So when you say you, you write your own book, but you're with Patterson, is it co? Oh, no, writing? Patterson works with him. Those are co-written books. Those are, those are and people ask, you know, how involved is he? Two people. That's one of his big series. We talk yeah. a lot. Yeah. Uh, but no, there's, uh, when I, my own books would be one of my early books, or I keep saying, I don't know, probably write one of my own books. Yeah. Probably I'm not going to, because I really like what I'm doing. Yeah. Right. And now I have the characters, I mean, people think you just jump right in. Mm -hmm. I'm 10 books in, and I, I just, realized on the last book that I was working on, oh, I just figured out this one character perfectly. And now I'm excited I just started a new one uh, two weeks ago. That character is going to feature a little bit more in the book because now I have some, some good insight into it. What's the setting when you're writing these books? What, what, where do you get your inspiration? Where are you? Are you at home? Are you oh, 
what word are you writing? Where are you I'm completely writing? misunderstood at the beginning, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, it's New York City. It's a New York City. <laughs> I actually write, uh, I have an office, uh, which I'll tell one funny story. So we, we bought this old rigid house. We've, we've done a lot of work, but the upstairs is completely gutted. So uh, when the rooms were assigned, which I apparently had no input in whatsoever, <laughs> I get an office, I get a room right up front, and the, the upstairs right above me. And I would work, on my try to work, and they literally were using a jackhammer one day. <laughs> and I made a little video, and said, and this is how I write a book. <laughs> and two guys that were up there, drywall guys, one day, are, all day, they're up there, and they are, they do not get along, oh. shouting back and forth, and using language that, frankly, even as a cop, I had never, <laughs> as they're leaving, one of them says, did you hear anything about the presenter up there? I'm like, hey, do you think I'm deaf? I'm just curious. <laughs> But I, I, uh, I have an office. What I try to do to keep from getting is I work and I have a, I make notes. And then I either dictate or I, uh, I'll dictate it and either use Dragon Athlete speaking or we have a secretary. But most of what I do is dictated. Mm -hmm. So I make extensive notes. We're going away for a week starting Monday. I, I don't need to bring heavy computers to dictate stuff because I'll make a week's worth of notes. And then in one day, I'll have a lot to work with. Uh, but I worked, at, I worked at Jay Park quite a bit, because they had their pavilions there. I listened to the steel drum music from the Carnival Cruise Line. Mm -hmm. On Monday morning, that's always a favorite. I'll either run or ride my bike on the beach, swim, clean up, and then work for a couple hours. And it, it keeps you from that stereotype of a writer just kind of wasting away in his office. Yeah, yes. Actually, you received a life-saving medal from the governor for saving a family from the connection. Is that true? Yes. That's, yeah. That just freaked me out. Oh, um, okay. Yes, I did. Uh, she said, you are the most talented writer I've ever met. But again, uh, we, uh, Tell one point story. So my wife is back there, and she is a good sport. And I make jokes. I, I, she'll remember this. Years and years ago, I was at a book festival in Martin County, and uh, it was great. It was a huge crowd, and someone said, uh, "When did you? Why did you start writing when you did?" And I said, "And it's a joke. This is a joke. I, I shouldn't have to say this, but see, uh, my wife was pregnant. She had a baby, and." Uh, Figured I'd have some free time. I wasn't sure if it was my baby or not. But <laughs> <laughs> someone said to her afterwards, uh, "You get any trips like that?" She says, "I guess I have to go back to work with them. I don't give a shit." What? Is <laughs> but uh, on, she, she was reading about. I, I, uh, I very late in my career, uh, what we witnessed would come down 95 on a Sunday. We had worked all weekend in, in North Carolina looking for a fugitive. We were coming back and we saw a car accident. It turned out to be a really serious car accident. And uh, I had helped and we uh, pulled this little girl out who had been flown from it. But I, I went home right from there and I was soaked and I had to go on and stop it. But I walked in the garage, I don't remember this doing, like 8 30. She turns on light and I'm already in the garage. And I'm like, <gasps> And I said, don't worry, it's not my blood. And I realized, number one, that is a weird thing to ever have to say. No. <laughs> and number two, it was not the first time I had ever had to say it. <laughs> so I hand back there. Yes, sir. I've got at least two questions. OK. The first question is, can you elaborate on your experiences with publishers? And what advice would you give a first time author? OK. Uh, so, let me take your second question first. If you're already writing, and this is the thing that I've been steadfast on for 20 years. If you're already writing, you're so far ahead of the game because you have something you enjoy doing. And that's the only, really, the only reason to write, is you enjoy doing it. Uh, so, I'm assuming you're a writer. 
Yes. Did you start it because you love to write? Oh, sure. But that was part of it. But was it good no one starts to write to say, I'm going to write novels. You know, I hate it. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, the odds are stacked against everyone. I was wildly lucky. And I did have a writer tell me once, don't tell people you were lucky. And I was lucky. It went to the, the right agent saw it, who presented it to the right editor. My editor, that editor, who's long retired, told me, I said, did you buy a lot of stuff from my former agent? He goes, yours was the first and last thing I ever bought from him. Wow. So it was just wild chance. So uh, there are only really five publishers in New York anymore. There's a lot, it sounds like there's a lot, but every publisher has about between 10 and 50 uh, outlets underneath it. So I, right now I work for Hachette Books, which includes Gallery Books, uh, Grand Central, Technical Grand Central. So there, there's a lot of different publishers. But there are publishers, and I wouldn't call them a tier down, they are not in New York, like in, in Florida. The first one that jumps to mind is Ocean View Publishing. You guys ever heard of that? They're an excellent publisher. I may be colored because I know the guy who owns it, uh, Bob Gusson, and he is a super guy. Uh, they're very discerning. I sent a couple of people their way thinking, my name should carry some weight. Turns out I was incorrect. Mm. So uh, it's just hard. There's Severn House. Uh, there's a number of, of regional publishers that do a great job. Uh, but I would say uh, the, the big publishers, they're harder to break into. A lot of people started the smaller publishers, they get noticed. It used to be a lot of people started with paperbacks, with paperback originals, and then would move on to hardback. Now there's not the paperback market like there used to be. So it's a tricky question. I'm not an expert in publishing. You know, I know a lot of them. It seems like a harsh business to me. I can't tell you how many, from the class when I started, the 35 writers that I knew the first time I went to a conference, Dr. Khan, the International Mystery Writers Conference, there's not three or four of them that went past the two book people. Oh, wow. And today, there's only one of them I can think of that's still published. <clears throat> yes, sir. Can I elaborate on your question to me? Uh, I've, I've been a, a contributing author in books since 1998, I guess. I'm a member of the Space Coast Writers Guild. I've been a contributing author to the anthology series within the guild. But I'm writing a book now about African Americans that work the kind of space mm. I'm a retired uh, four five years. That's not a novel. novel. That's gonna be a nonfiction, right? It's gonna be a nonfiction book. Yeah. Nonfiction books. Nonfiction sells much easier than fiction. And uh, that subject in particular, I, and with your background, I don't want to build up your hopes or it, but it seems to me someone would be interested in that. I'd be interested in that and reading it. That's how I usually judge stuff. People pitch me books. And I'll thank you for it. I would never read that. But what you just said, I would be interested in. This is an interesting book. <laughs> <laughs> and that may be something that Ocean View would be interested because they have done a couple of nonfiction books. I went to Afghanistan. And this is, again, opportunities. Uh, one of my friends had an idea for a short story, I mean, for a you know, documentary. And he didn't have quite the contacts he needed to in with the military and stuff. And it was a little insulting. He said, hey, you've got plenty of time and if something happens, you can pay for your way back. <laughs> and it's not what you want to hear about your, you know, uh, about your talent. Hey, you've got free time. And what he was saying is no one was really going to miss me and Donna would move on pretty quick. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, I went to Afghanistan and we were back on the airbase. And it was really interesting. And we, we flew on helicopters all over. We went to Jalalabad, which is uh, one of the forward operating bases. Fenty was there. So uh, I just took the character from our first two books and made it where, for some reason, he had to go to Afghanistan. It was a lot of fun because I wasn't thinking about 100,000 words or 70,000 words. It's like 25,000 words. And it moved quick. Uh, and then he put all three of them into that book, released it as a, 
a trade paper, and I was, I was very happy. But I don't see it around a lot. In fact, I was here in this room last week for their book sale, and the only one of my books that I could buy back was that one that someone was getting rid of from the library. <laughs> <laughs> but going back to your question, was I ever confident? I am still not confident, and I'll admit that. I, sometimes I'll think, oh, this is really good. And more, probably at least 10 times, I've handed something to Patterson, say 40 pages, thinking, he's probably just going to have me move in with him and adopt me because that's the only way he could show his appreciation. And uh, it just happened on a, I had a pitch for our next uh, Bennett novel that uh, I'll tell you how well it went. That is not the book I'm working on right now. <laughs> I handed it in and it had to do with NASA. Uh, because I, that's what I see every morning when I walk out of my house. I see the B&B across from me. And uh, I, I was very excited about this book. It still was a New York City detective book, but it had some elements down here. And I just, I almost started working on the book. I didn't hear back from him yet. Because he doesn't, he gets back to people quickly who are new. But if you've been around for a while, he knows you're not too nervous. And when he called me, I can summarize a, the conversation. No, we're not going to do this one. No. That was it. So uh, I try not to, to get overconfident on stuff, but uh, I, it was never anything that just said, you need to do this. If there was, maybe I would have quit the job prematurely. Who knows? Uh, it, as I tell my kids now, everything works out. Or it doesn't. It doesn't matter. They're still here. Uh, I really appreciate everyone coming out. I know they're going to auction off some books, or not auction them. Yeah. No, raffle off somewhere. We will raffle uh, donate this book. About a dozen of them. And then if, if you guys want to buy any and the money goes to the Y, uh, I don't know that we have any. Gene, uh, were you going to? Well, uh, want to do we'll it. I've never actually sold my own book, so I don't know how to do it. We'll raffle a dozen of them.